What is the number one sin? Oops, sorry. What is the number one sin? The number one sin that God most... Ah, very good, Dennis. Very good. Uh, the number one sin is idolatry. Idolatry is the number one. Now, it is, it is uh, you know, by far, uh, outbeat any other thing. Now, God's people fail to remain separate from the godless nations that are around them. The other nations, they don't worship God. They don't have God in their mind, right? They worship all kinds of false gods, all right? So um, the people failed. So instead, what did they do? They imitated their evil ways. And there are many themes we could highlight during the period of this divided kingdom. But the most dominant one is about idolatry. You will always see that. Why is it that God was angry about them? idolatry there are many more like injustice they don't they they, they oppress the the poor the widow the orphan and so on but the most cannot tahan one the most jalat one okay is idolatry all right so we will spend some time looking at this point and uh, see the theology behind so what is idolatry idolatry originates in the heart okay it is in the mind and it is not what is in the hand not just in the hand, it is in the heart and in the mind. Now, what's in the hand is just a byproduct. An idol, a patong, is whatever, it can be just not just the patong that you hold in the hand. An idol is, it can be here, in here. The worst one is here, okay, in the heart and in the mind. An idol is whatever we love, we esteem, we follow or prioritize above God Himself. An idol can refer to any God or anything that is besides the one true God, or to an image, an image only appearing like an image of the true God, but actually departing from the purity of his appointed form of worship. So we already noted the initial spiritual departure from Solomon's idolatry. And that brings us to Jeroboam. Okay, idolatry, Solomon, worship all other gods because of all these wives and the concubines that he has. Bring him to worship all kinds of gods, okay? So now we come to Jeroboam, the first kings of the separated northern kingdom. You see what he did. In 1 Kings chapter 12, we read about that he established in rebellion against God's law a separate form of worship in the north with a separate priesthood, separate high places, separate, you know, it's like a counterpart, huh? or more accurately, it's a counterfeit counterfeit cities to Jerusalem. Whatever the south has, he made a copy, but it's actually a counterfeit, okay? And he also established a kind of holiday so that people have some kind of comfort to themselves, but actually they didn't go to the... God already says, you know, every male in Israel, three festivals that you must present yourself in Jerusalem, in the appointed place, one place, one singular place. But then he made the same kind of holiday, but now you get a different God. A very important, very important lesson to us because it means that actually uh, you can copy Christianity uh, so well copied, you know, but actually uh, inside of it, uh, you actually don't have the worship of God. Can you imagine that? Right? Everything was the same. Everything was exact. You know, you feel like it. You can even uh, fabricate it how you actually want it to feel. You know, the emotions, the sensation, the tone of it, uh, the, 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 the music even, uh, the smell of it. But actually, uh, the whole thing, uh, you're not worshipping God. It happens in the history of, of Israel. Okay, don't say it doesn't happen. And this, I don't know about you, but biblical theology, if you can still have your mind wrapped there, what does it remind you of? There's something, especially in the book of Genesis. Uh, that's why I say you need to relate to the first five books of Moses. One, uh. In Genesis, uh, there is something over there that looks exactly like this picture. What was it? What was the picture? You know, everything was look the same, feel the same. You even can comfort yourself that, oh, yo, we are almost there. Yeah, la, we have already reached there. What was the thing? 
what was the thing that human is their own intelligence, their own innovation they built, but then that whole plan was being disrupted and being, uh, 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 um, being uh, shot down by God. What was it? You all can remember uh, in Genesis, very, very early part. We've talked about it, it already, but I don't know whether you can remember. Uh, Genesis chapter 6 or 11, I, I, I believe. 11, I think. Yeah, I believe it's 11. It's after, um, is it 11? I think so. Okay, what was it? Very iconic one. Huh? What was it? I say the word iconic, really, you should remember. What was it? What was it? In Genesis, one story that almost sounds like this. What was it? Genesis chapter 11. Ah, those of you who flip the Bible fast, you will know. Genesis chapter 11. What do you find there? The Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel. Huh? The Tower of Babel that goes up to the sky. Huh? That goes up to heaven. Huh? And then you will make your name great there. Right? Reach heaven. No? Human beings can reach heaven. No? Okay? All of us, we stay together in one place. Huh? There's nothing... Practically nothing that God says, there's nothing that they cannot achieve uh, because in their wickedness, uh, they want to make what? They want to make a name for themselves. They want to make a name for themselves that reach to heaven. What does it mean? It means they are able to want to challenge heaven. In other words, they want to make or they want to create a counterfeit Eden, a counterfeit returning or a counterfeit road back to Eden. Okay, so that is it. All right, counterfeit. All right, so at the center of this were idols. Okay, you read here in this verse that I put up so long already, right? Yeah, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Ah, yeah, here is your gods. La. Same la. Okay, ah, yeah, which god also the same la. You're only in the heart, ma, right? Heart only ma, can around, right? Ah, I yeah, just put a patong there, never mind one la. It's golden, is it golden some more? Ma, quite okay ma, right? Some more got two. I didn't give you one, I give you two. Oh. You see, brought you out of Egypt. Can la, can la, just take it la. Huh? Uh, you see? So now all of this should sound familiar to you. It is a repeat of the incident we read back in Exodus 32. If you go to Exodus 32, you will find the first golden calf of the people of, the, of Israel. All right? During the absence of Moses, Moses went up to the mountain and then he got the tablet from God. And then Aaron, the people made Aaron to make a golden calf for them. And then they celebrated, they sing song, they worship, they sing uh, uh, party over the golden calf. Okay. Now, you remember that in the second commandment of the law, it prohibits all form of idolatry. You're not supposed to make any kinds of gods. Okay. And that God's biblical law of worship requires his people not only to worship him as he commanded without addition, or subtraction. You cannot use any kind of uh, other kind of form of worship that God does not allow. So you should remember the words of Deuteronomy as well. He says, okay, so that you do not become corrupt. He says, you saw no form of any kind the day that God spoke to you at Horeb. Horeb means where? Mount Sinai. Eh? Another name for Sinai, if you can still remember. Out of the fire, because uh, there was thunder and lightning and fire, okay? Now, therefore, watch yourself very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make yourself for yourself an idol, an image of any kind of shape. And then you can continue to read on. Verse 20 says, But as for you, the Lord who took you and brought you out of the iron smelting furnace, out of Egypt, who brought you out? The Lord, Yahweh, to be the people of his inheritance as you now are. Okay, so you cannot worship and bow down to the sun, the moon, the stars, the sky, and entice to worship them. That God has a portion to all the nations that's under heaven, which means that those belong to other nations. But for you, cannot. You cannot. Okay, if the other nations they worship is their, it is their issue. Okay, for that time, because God wants the nation of Israel to be set apart to be separated from them so that from them, they may see, the other nations may see what is the, uh, the worship of God. 
So notice in Exodus 32, you will see here, uh, you look carefully, eh? he took what they handed him and made into an idol cast in the image of a calf, singular, a calf, right? And then these are your gods. Then they say, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. Notice one singular calf that is being made, but plural gods are worshipped. One calf, but gods. That means what? That means Yahweh now has become one of the two gods. One of the two gods or one of the gods over there. The plural gods. So Yahweh is no longer the only. And this shows one thing. Eh? Number one, point number one, polytheism comes from the man's fallen nature. Polytheism comes from where? It's not come from nature. It comes from man's fallen nature. That's polytheism. And then in first, polytheism means many gods, uh -huh, worship of many gods. Now, first Kings chapter 12, verse 28. Okay, we read this already. The king made two golden cups. It is too much for you. Here are your gods. All right. So now here is a double. Okay, so point number two is fallen man's creativity. Eh? If it's fallen man, eh, the creativity, his creativity does not lead them back to the creator. But more corrupted anarchy, more corrupted kind of uh, rebellion from one calf to two calves. So Yahweh is no longer needed in the redemptive work of Exodus. Who brought you out of Egypt? Two calves brought you out of Egypt. Where is Yahweh? Yahweh is now being reduced to a buffalo. Okay? Now, all the images of God are prohibited and all forms of other gods are condemned. And this is a clear violation of God's law. The sin of idolatry continues to persist through the remainders of the kings. Uh, worse and worse and worse, which provoke God's wrath and asking, inviting for him to discipline them. Eventually, you will read that. Because in Isaiah chapter 48, 42, verse 8, he says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. So let me point out one more important consequence of idolatry. What could be that? Well, it is this, that we resemble what we worship. We look like what we worship. We become like what we worship. And that is a very significant theological point in the Old Testament. Remember that, okay? What you become, be careful. Because you resemble what you worship. Ah, okay. So in Psalm 115, it says this, but the idols are silver and gold made by human. They have human hands, they have mouth but cannot speak, yes, eyes but cannot see, they have ears, cannot hear, noses, cannot smell, they have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them. And so or will all who trust in them. So this is a principle you can trace all throughout the Bible. And we, we become like what we worship. And there's more, okay? Humans, as the image bearers of God, are supposed to reflect God to the whole world. How does the world see God or know God? Look at human. Human is supposed to be the image of God, isn't it? Okay, natural world and supernatural world, look at human beings. They will see God, but now they don't. So how do human beings reflect now? What do they reflect now? They reflect created beings. Okay, so this resemblance will ruin us. In the case of idolatry or alternatively, if it's not, then you should restore us. In the case of worshipping God. So who you worship, it will actually cause, it will actually affect you. To destroy you, or to restore you. And remember this, okay? You can write it down somewhere. True God made man. False gods, man made. True God made man. False gods, man made. Okay? In the case of idolatry, we will suffer God's punishment along with the punishment of the idols that we worship, okay, and resembles. So God's holy Jealousy, he will not tolerate idols. He cannot share his glory with idols. If we make them, he will break them. In all of this, we see the story of Israel turning away from God's covenant. And they became the covenant breakers, subjected to the covenant curses. Okay, And this will become very clear 
if you study the history of the kings and compare to what you read to God's warning that is found in Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26. Deuteronomy 28, very important chapter, very, very important, Deuteronomy 28. If you've got time, please read through the list of blessing and cursing. You will look there and remember when we say about curses, it is not that God, you know, try to uh, put human beings or become evil and curse people. No, blessing and cursing is actually the part of the covenant. Okay, the covenant promise for the, disobe for the obedient, the covenant curses for the disobedient. Same is found in Leviticus 26. Okay, so you can actually trace the details point by point. All right, um, so read God's warning. Okay, read God's warning uh, in the, uh, 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 where? Uh, yeah, Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26. And God always fulfills his promises. Both the blessings and the curses, God's people were exiled because God was faithful to keep his covenant. So he brought the promise curse. You read Deuteronomy 28, the exile should not be a surprise to you. It is like the last, 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 last resort that God really, really cannot tolerate them anymore. And just to give you some background and some introduction, okay, these are some of the gods or false gods that the people of Israel, they worship, ancient Israel. Okay, the first one is Asherah. Asherah is usually portrayed like this. Okay, a, a, a woman that is holding her breast that is actually, uh, the breast is very, very awkward one as he, as he holds, okay, all kinds of sizes is being, and usually it's standing up. That's why you hear the word, uh, the pole of Asherah or the Asherah pole, okay. Asherah, it is also, um, uh, the word Asher, Asher or as, Aser, Asa, okay, maybe it comes from the word Asa, I'm not too sure. Asa means make, okay, or create. Asa, make or create. Eh? So Ashira, if you read the history, eh, you will see that it is actually uh, kind of like if Yahweh is the male God, okay, the male creator of heaven and earth, then they picture him to have a female counterpart. And the female counterpart name is called Ashira. Okay, R-A-H, uh, A-H usually denotes female. Okay, so that's why I say Asher, Aser, Asa. Okay, it could be coming from the same place. Okay, um, this is the Egyptian rendition of the same goddess. And you can see that the moon and the sun is above her head. So he, she is quite powerful. Huh? She's called, she's in this, in this, in this uh, picture, she is considered the queen of heaven. Okay, so you can see uh, why God is so cannot take it. Uh, why God cannot tolerate it? Because they make God to have a female counterpart. God does not have a female counterpart. Okay? God himself is able to make men, male, and female. He doesn't need a female counterpart. And today, you still see this kind of thinking, uh, is uh, found a lot uh, in the cults. Uh? Some, somehow people will say that, for example, there is this Mother God Church, the Korean cult, uh, are very famous. Their office is in PJ only. Okay? Uh, nowadays, they, 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 they come in, uh, they sneak into our country uh, as a kind of uh, 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 a charity association or some kind of, and then they spread their, their cults teaching, their cultic teaching. Okay? They say that you look, God, uh, in the Genesis, he made male and female, right? That means there must be a father God and there must be a mother God nah? because then only the, the images resembles him. Nah? Who says so? Who says that God must have male and female then only can make male and female? Nah? So if that is the case, if, if, if there is no uh, male or female, there are many things around us. If you study science, you will understand. There are many things around us that are considered asexual organism. So asexual organism is being created by who? So there must be an asexual uh, creator, is it? You understand what I'm trying to say? The logic is not there. For those who study science, uh, this logic really cannot work. Okay? Now that is one. 
And then today, uh, there's another one is called Baal or Baal, okay, Baal, very famous also, you can see in the, in the Old Testament, all right? Um, I, you can read more from, 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 uh, from the internet, okay, about Baal, but more or less, this Baal is actually some, Baal means master, master, uh, some kind of master or, uh, uh, yeah, master, la, basically master, la. so you can see that uh, some are seated down, some are standing up, uh, and, and more or less, you can see some kind of uh, resemblance uh, of, um, I don't know what he's doing there. But this one, this one uh, usually has to do with agriculture. And then you look at this one. This one is very, very famous also. It's called Molek. Okay. You look at the face. Uh, the face is a head of a calf. Ah, the golden calf has become like a human body now. Uh. And it is made of brass hollow inside, there was a place inside to make fire in it, so there's a pit inside, actually a furnace that is inside. When it got very hot, uh, the wicked people used to put their little children in their arms, okay? This, these arms is actually to put the children there. Why do people sacrifice their male children? You may be wondering why. Why people want to do that? Do you know why? Okay, one of the many reasons is because they feel that in order for them, you know, uh, last time people, uh, they, they are very dependent on the agriculture uh, because agriculture is the main thing, right? It's the, it's the most important thing. You don't have food, your, your harvest, no harvest uh, means uh, the whole, or famine strikes uh, means uh, you've got no food, you know, okay? So people will suffer. So in order for, for to, to give whatever that is, they produce, lah, okay, whatever they produce, Okay, the most intimate one, uh, the most ultimate one is your own children. No? Your own children no? that comes from your own womb no? that you produce. La. Okay, not from your land only, but from your own producer, so, you know, your own womb. Uh. Okay, so they think, so they come to a point that this kind of religion tells them that you can actually offer your children. That's your ultimate one uh, in order to get the ultimate blessing uh, on your your agriculture on your on your plantation or whatever. Okay? So you see, little children are being burned to death. Burned to death. And by the way, also, uh, bear in mind those years, uh, those age, those era, uh, where got birth control, uh, right or not? So they're probably uh, able uh, to produce a lot, a lot, a lot of babies. Uh, okay? So you can see uh, all this kind of thing is being, is being uh, taken care of and then uh, it's being shown like that. And then you see other men are blowing the trumpet and beating on the drums. You see? Why? So that uh, the noise is so loud uh, that the people cannot hear the poor little child crying in fire, uh, burning, uh, like barbecue. Uh. Okay? That's what they did. Okay? That's what they do. Can you imagine that human mind uh, have come to such kind of corruption until their morality uh, will cause them to burn lives alive like that? No wonder God cannot take it. How is it possible you build this kind of thing and worship this kind of thing and offer your children like that huh, to this thing that you make and call this thing God? When you have a God that brought you out of Egypt, passed by the Red Sea, lead you by the pillar of fire, cloud and pillar of fire, how is it that you do that? That shows uh, when human beings turn to idolatry, they create stuff in their mind and their heart uh, until uh, the worship of God comes to this kind of standard, uh, comes to this kind of bad standard, very, very, very cannot, very unthinkable kind of standard. Okay? So that is, that is very bad. All right? Now, last point, last point. How is it, how are these going to uh, carry out in the New Testament? All right? Well, for, uh, we think of this, how does it carry forward to the New Testament, connecting it to the development of the New Testament. Now, John Calvin, he warned that the human heart is a perpetual factory of idols. The human heart is a perpetual factory of idols. And this, the lesson about idolatry uh, continue in the contemporary Christian life. That means us, okay? We read in the incident of Exodus 32. If you've got time, please go and read Exodus 32. Very important um, uh, um, story over there. Very important. If you read that time, make sure you read slowly. Notice all the words that are being used there. 
Okay, read it slowly. We read in the New Testament the same thing in 1 Corinthians. It says, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters. Idolaters. What is idolat idolatry again? Idolatry is not make idols. Huh? Idolatry means that you already make something in your mind, in your heart, that is bigger than God. God says no. You say no, God. You say yes. God says no. Human beings are made male and female. Marriage is between man and woman. You say no, God. I don't care. I want man and man. I want woman and woman. That is also idolatry. You say God. You, God says you must be holy because I, the Lord your God, is holy. Holy means what? Holy not just means pure, keep yourself pure and clean, but holy also means you're separated from the world. You say, no, I want to be as close to the world as possible. I want to be exactly like how the world. Why we cannot do that? Why, why the world can do that? We cannot do that? I know I want also. I want whatever the world is listening, practicing, doing, thinking about having the kind of value. I want them also. I want to feel like as if I am in the world. That is what? Idolatry. That's idolatry, all right? So you can say that, oh, but, but the West also have, ma, they're also Christian nation, what? Huh? How come there are some churches that allow this, allow that? Huh? They are also, uh, 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 you know, read the same Bible also, ma, you know? Some theologian also can say that, uh, can have this kind of thing called the, the feminist theology or the uh, LGBT theology, you know? I also want to, what is that? Idolatry. Okay? Now, the warning echoes throughout the whole New Testament. For example, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 to 17. He says here, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? Temple of God and idols, memang no agreement. But who is the temple here? We are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. See, God is very jealous about who is my people because I am their God. So therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. Remember, who you worship, you will become like that. Okay? So John concludes in his first epistle, first letter. He says, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourself from all these things that exalt itself in your mind, in your heart against God. Keep yourself from them. So the warning about idolatry is as relevant today as it's ever been. It is still is an expression of God's holy jealousy and of the holy standards of his law. But the gospel does more than deliver us from idolatry. The gospel actually heals Right? Those who worship the true God in spirit and in truth are transformed into his likeness. We become like what we worship. God made man after his own image in the garden. And that, of course, was damaged after the fall, right? But God remains only the only lawful focus of our worship. And those who come to him by faith in the gospel and worship him as he has appointed in his word experience, they will experience the restoration of his likeness through the Spirit. Okay, through the Holy Spirit. And 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says this, We all who with unveiled faces contemplate the God's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. Can you see that? The transformation is a process of getting you becoming more and more and more like his image with increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says the same thing. Those who foreknew, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. His Son, the Son of God, becomes like the true humankind. What kind of humankind do we want to restore into? Like Christ. Like Christ image. So that the warning about not making any images, any image of God or any other idols, but there's also a promised blessing of worshipping God and being made into the image like Him. 
So that's very important. Application point, eh? application point. You know, it is so hard for somebody who is actually um, being addicted, especially, for example, to pornography. Pornography does a lot of images in you, in the person. Okay? Um, that images are idols. That images are idolatry also. Because you worship, you kind of bow down to that images more than you bow down to God. And so you become addicted, become enslaved by it. And this, this kind of thing has actually plagued many young people, men or women, young men, young women, also the same thing. Okay? Today, you see a lot of things that come out on your phone. A lot of things are very image-driven. And it's not accident, it's not a coincidence. Okay? Because they know what kind of thing that will drag people, that will capture people, image. Okay, so what, what, how to help somebody besides counseling? One of the most important things is that image needs to be changed, needs to be transformed. So, how do you do that? Come back, return, throw away the idols, come back to God, come back to the worship of God because who you worship, you resemble. If you worship all these images that are corrupted, that are immoral, that are twisting sets, that are making you know, all kinds of funny things about sex that you don't actually have to get married to be able to enjoy sex and all these kind of things. Okay? Eventually, your, if you are married, it is going to affect your sex life. If you are not married, it's going to affect how you're going to treat the other opposite sex or the same sex worse still. Okay? You will see every man, if you're same sex, attraction, see every man, you will see as potential victim. Or, you know, if you see, if, if you, are, you are attracted to, uh, if you are heterosexual, okay, then you, are, you, are, uh, you look at any other girls, you know, all kind of images come inside. You see, what, what happened? What you idolize or what you worship as idols there, that becomes what you resemble. Mm. Think about it. It makes sense one. It is application. Okay, next, in the Old Testament period of the divided kingdom, we read about one king after another, one king after another. You know, we are being forced to conclude. And this is the point. Like, when you read it at the time, you're almost like, Hiya, why? You know, you already started quite well already. Why you go and worship idols? Why you go and turn to other gods? You know, this is the time that you're very kicked on at this time. Okay, when you read 1st Kings, 2nd Kings, 1st uh, Chron Second Chronicles, you will see all this. Okay. And you come to conclude that, no, this is not the king. This is not the one. He is not the great king that is promised. It is another and a greater king that is still coming. So you keep on waiting and waiting and waiting and see. You know, keep on reading and see. Can it be better or not? Can it improve or not? Okay? In other words, we are left waiting and looking until the last Messiah or last Christ appears in the pages in the New Testament as that true and ultimate heir to David's throne. Christ is the only king who is truly after God's own heart because he is the divine Messiah. He would succeed in bringing about God's dominion where Adam originally failed and all the kings of Israel failed miserably. And we see that in the description of Christ being ascended and this Christ being ascended is being foretold. Huh? Can you imagine that? Old Testament foretold how Christ is going to ascend to his throne. You look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days, which is God here, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Who fits in the bill except the Son of Man and the Son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, right? So this is like the picture of his ascension. What happened? What happened? This, this Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to verse 14 is the best to be read on when, you know, Holy Saturday. Holy Saturday. Huh? Holy Saturday is the best to be read there. Okay? Good Friday, Holy Saturday. And Jesus applied this text to himself also in the Gospels. Earlier in Daniel 2, chapter 2, God described, you remember, 
He told the Pharisees, "What you will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds on heaven." Remember that, nah? Ah, the Pharisees remember and know exactly what he was talking about. This is Daniel chapter seven. Okay, they read, they know their scripture, but they just don't want to acknowledge that he is the one. All right. So God in Genesis, Daniel chapter two, if you read, you see God describing the kingdom of Christ in a dream to Nebuchadnezzar. He says, God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or will be left to another people. It will crush all those nation, kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. So this text in Daniel 7 and Daniel 2 stand behind the great commission of Jesus. What did Jesus say? Take the gospel, go to the ends of the earth and disciples the nations at the very end of Matthew chapter 28. We read about that, right? So the great commission is there. Now, application time. The Old Testament history supplies the background for the theme of the kingdom in the New Testament. What's the kingdom of God? Why suddenly Jesus say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. What is that about? Because of the Old Testament supplying the theme for the kingdom, the correct kingdom, the kingdom of the right king, right? The kingdom of Christ excels every other because Christ the king excels all the other. He is the king of kings. The kingdom will extend throughout the whole earth. That's why he teach us to pray what? May your kingdom come. Who asks you to pray that? May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? This is the Lord's prayer. The Lord is teaching us to pray that. Right? So, if that is the, that is the, that is the point, if that is the case, now, let me ask you a question. Who are you? Are you in the kingdom of God? Are you in the kingdom of Christ? Are you, is Christ your king? If he is, then no wonder when you say proclaim the gospel, what does it mean? It is the gospel about what? Okay. Revelation 11 verse 15 says, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And you see the ultimate success of the gospel that is among the nations in the description of heaven. The nations will walk by its light, the light that comes from Christ, right? The Lamb. And the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Who are the kings of the earth? Who are the kings of the earth? The people of God. The children of God. The kings of the earth. You and I. Here is a beautiful picture. Here is the great king, the promised one who are whom we are left waiting for all through the reading of the Old Testament. And what kingdom is like his? There's no other comparison. It's matchless. It's peerless. So Solomon's original prayer remained the heart cry of every true Christian today. Second Kings, um, oh, okay. First Kings chapter 8, verse 59. Huh? Which I have prayed before the Lord, okay, he says that, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is no other. Okay? Psalm 67 also remain our song because we are asking the Lord to take the glorious gospel of his grace to all the nations and make them glad in the Lord Jesus Christ. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. Right? Sounds where? Sounds like what? Numbers, right? The benediction. Numbers chapter 6, I think. So that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples, plural, praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. Right? And this psalm also inspired the song called Joy to the World, right? So may the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. And all this you can see that the peoples, 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 peoples are being mentioned. Everybody, the global people, everyone else, right? So the application point again, Evangelism is not just an activity of, you know, trying to be religious, piety, but proclaiming the good news to the whole world. Why proclaim the good news? What good news? The good news is that there is the king 
The rightful king has already come and the government of his kingdom will know no end. Will know no end. And he has accomplished the salvation that ought to have happened with every other king. And he will come again. And that is why it means by proclaiming the gospel, by preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel is not to preach a motivational talk to stir up people's, you know, to inspire people or stir up people's passion to serve God. Or No, preaching the gospel is to talk about announcing the gospel. The gospel means here is the royal news, you know, the royal news of that king that has already come. Huh? So if the king has already come, what should all the people do in response they must come and submit to the king the kings of the earth will come into the splendor bringing their gifts and subject themselves to the king of all kings to the kings of king of kings jesus right so do we do that or not or do we preach the gospel you know once a year when easter is coming like now this 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 you know this season do we preach the gospel in order to get membership? Do we preach the gospel so that we get people to do what? What are they supposed to respond to? Huh? So that they can get healed, so that they can get their healing, they can get their benefit, they can get their success, they can get their prayer answered, is it? No. The ultimate thing, the ultimate goal about proclaiming the gospel, preaching the gospel, or pre yeah, preaching right itself, is to announce that the king, the rightful king, has already come. And he has come to accomplish salvation. This salvation word uh, is not to save them from hell alone. This salvation word, if you read ancient literature, you will know the salvation word means that it is a rescue, it's a deliverance. It's like giving you a help. You are helpless, you cannot help yourself. You are so poor, you are... You, you, you totally cannot help yourself at all. So what, what will deliver you? What will help you from the situation? Salvation. Save you, right? From your, that situation. That is what it means by salvation. Salvation is not giving you a, a chance to go to heaven. Sometimes we think like that. No, it's not. It's not particularly just go to heaven. That's all. You have to understand the kingdom first. If not, you go which heaven? Every religion doesn't say you got heaven. So you go to which heaven? You go to the Western world, la, Western world of happiness, la, like what some religions say. And which kind of heaven you're going to? Salvation is for what? You see? So to us, what the Bible what the Bible and what the gospels is preaching to us uh, in the gospels and the four gospels, you will see. Uh, what did Jesus say? Repent, turn back, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For the kingdom of God is here. Okay? So what does it mean? Which kingdom? This is the proclamation by the king himself. No? The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of heaven is here. Now here. Right? So those who are being oppressed, those who are poor, you know, th those who are who are, who are um, set, setting the captives free. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, right? For He has anointed me, me to preach the gospel, to proclaim the good news to the poor, those who cannot help themselves. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Prisoners cannot help themselves. They are only waiting to die, right? The recovery of sight for the blind. Blind people cannot help themselves. In the olden days, there was no other assistant aid to, to their vision. No. To set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The acceptable year of the Lord. The Lord has accepted you. The kingdom is now here. The rightful king has come. That's what salvation is all about. Especially what? Sin. Oppressed by what? Oppressed by sin. That's the worst one. Okay, the prison of sin. So, in conclusion, after the kingdom divides, the northern and the southern, right? So, both Judah and Israel turn away from God's covenant. They turn to idolatry. 
as we have seen, and God sets them before them the path, the blessings and the curses. In Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, it is clear in the Old Testament that God's great king had not yet come. Not yet come. The exile, remember I told you the last chapter and verse for the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible is actually Second Chronicles. Right? They went back to Jerusalem. They were allowed by Darius, King Darius, back to Jerusalem. But the king has not yet come. That is why when you come to the Gospels, you will see there is a voice preparing the way of the Lord in the wilderness. John the Baptist was a forerunner for the king, was a herald for the king to come. Right? And in, so in this lesson, we have focused on the history and we look at the theology. What is all this kingdoms thing all about? Why, 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 why these kings turn to idols and all these things and then God has to you know, punish them by exile and all those kind of things. Why is the significance? The significance is because they're waiting for the king, the rightful king okay, that is of David. Right? In the next lesson, we will take up the prophetic message. We will look at the prophets. So what's the message is all about? And God's word to his people during the same period. So the parallel history and prophecy running together. All right, so that will be our next lesson on the prophets. Okay, any question? We are done for tonight. That's all. Any question? If you have question, please ask. Okay, let me see. Uh. Ah, Tower of Babel. Okay, you all got it. Very good. Iconic. Yes, that's the word. Okay. Okay, any question? I'll give you all some time to think if you've got question. Or if you have something to reflect, you can share here also. What do you have to reflect? Maybe everybody do this. Uh -huh. Everybody do this. Okay. If you've got no question, you can you do a reflection. Okay. I'll give you about one, one or two minutes. Okay. Think through what you have learned tonight. Look through all the slides. Okay. Look through all the, 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 the verses that we have read tonight. And all the concepts that we have talked about tonight. Can you give one reflection of what you have learned tonight? One reflection, one thing. Okay, one thing, just one thing that you can share about. Okay. Um, yeah, just type in the chat box lah, if you can. All right. Let's share. Or you all prefer to go to breakout room. Not many people, also like 10 people only. Okay. No. I just share that in the chat box, okay? So, uh, yeah, type a little bit, you know. Um, yeah, I give you all some music, I give you some music. Uh, yeah, give you all some music, okay? Yeah, give you all some music, okay? Type a bit. What do you, what is your reflection for tonight? After hearing about all these, uh, people turning to idols la, you know we resemble what we worship la. The comparison between the godly king and the ungodly king la, and then the kingdom la, all this uh. so yeah I'll give you some background uh, some background okay? Okay, okay let me see what music can I give Okay, ambience now, ambience now.
okay, if you're done, can write your reflection in the chat box, okay? Don't take too long. Don't take too long. Okay, just one sentence will do. No need to be, no need to write karangan. Okay, no need to write essay. Okay, Justin says, it's actually quite a sad story that human kept creating gods when God was just right in front of them. It is like, as human, we all have a longing to look for God and worship, but we just miss God altogether and end up creating our own idols. Very good, very good. And that is the reason why, you know, one of the reasons why, okay? One of the reasons why that God must come in human flesh. Have you noticed it? Why God comes in human flesh? God can come in animal flesh, but he doesn't want it. You know why? Because human forgot that they are the image of God. Ah, you think about that, you will remember, you will understand. Why? Because human being has lost the image of God. They don't think that they reflect God. That's why they need to create something that they think are God, but actually they are not. Can you imagine that? So that is the reason why human being needs to come back to that image. Which image? What is the image? The, the image of God. Not Adam, because Adam's image was already corrupted. Adam's image was already fallen. So there's only one. And that is Christ. That's why he is also called the last Adam. You cannot have any more. So some people say uh, that Christianity has gone corrupted now. Uh, Oh, 600 years later, they have already gone corrupted. So they must, you know, they, they, uh, uh, some, God raised up some, some human being, another human leader, a military leader uh, to come and lead them back. No, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. If that's the case, then it makes God's word uh, uh, redundant. God's, God has already told a lie. And how, how, if God has told a lie in, in Christ, through Christ, then how is it that God can be trusted 600 years later through another person? There's no, no way. No way, okay? So it's either you tell a lie or God's tell a lie. I would, I would think that you tell a lie, not God tells a lie, okay? Joe, Joe says that um, to be aware of our own hearts, are we actually idolizing something or put simply putting otherworldly values above prioritizing God? Sometimes can get too caught up with work, success or money or even our own family. These are all worldly things that we should be aware that God and evangelism is the only thing that's most important. Yeah, evangelism in the sense that not just evangelism, like go and win souls, win souls, win souls, share gospel, share gospel. Of course, that's important, but it's not an activity that is the important. Okay, it is more important is you knowing God. It's you knowing God and you make him known. And that's much more important. Okay, so you are right. You can get caught up with many things in this world. So many things. Every single day, unless you really take time to read the Word of God, to understand the Word of God, to hear the heart of God from His Word, if not, you will get all kinds of counterfeit everywhere. All kinds, really. Nowadays, you see a lot of other motivations and everything, this guru, that guru, everything. They try to play, you know, some kind of infallible, cannot wrong one, the kind of human beings around us. Right? No matter how you want to, you want, you want to put them, they, they are like that. So you have to be careful. All right? Good. Help understand personally that idolatry isn't limited to just a physical figure. Uh, instead, what's on your mind and heart can be either as well and which is shown by prioritized when compared to God. Yes. Thank you, Barry. That is very good. Very important. Dennis, reflection. We become so forgetful in remembering God that we remember only what we want in God and try to replicate in our ideals and design. Very, very spot on. It is so true. It is so true. And that itself exposes our inner, inner, inner motive about God. Actually, we don't want God. We only want what God can give to us. Actually, we didn't want God, as in like God himself. We only want his shadow. You know, we want, we want, he, we want to feel some peace. We want to feel some some comfort, we want to feel that everything is alright, we want to feel that everything is promised to us, 
you want to feel this, feel that, know this, know that, all these things, and you ask everything, finish already. Huh? So what you want about God? Actually, I don't want God. And that is exactly that true kind of uh, picture, depiction about Jesus. About Jesus, isn't it? Right? Why is it that he was, he was, he come in human flesh like image of God come to you already. What do you do with him? You crucify him. Because I don't actually want that true king. I don't care whether he's still king or not. I just don't want him. Okay? So that is, that is the true depiction of it. Okay, I come to any more. If you have, you can type. Huh? Danny, you can try. Karina. Okay, Melinda. Serene, you can try. Okay? Now, I'll come to Danny's question. He asked for Exodus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. The law were given to the people, for example, on the curses and blessings. Yes, for example, if you, if you, uh, if you disobey God, you turn to other things. Okay, one of the curses is that he will, he will make uh, the rain doesn't fall down, for example. Okay, so your, your crops cannot grow and all that kind of thing, right? So will this still apply to us after Jesus died on the cross? No, it doesn't. Why? Because... On the cross, Jesus didn't just take upon himself, bear upon himself the sins of the whole world or us, okay, the people of God, but he also took away their curses. Remember that. That's very important. Huh? He also took away their curses. He also, by his stripes, so that by his stripes, humanity is healed. Not just diseases is healed. Okay, Many times we, we do that. We say that you know it's our diseases that is being healed. So, but you read First Peter, you don't see that. You will see that it is the whole of humanity being healed, not just the diseases. Even though diseases can be part of them, but that verse is, is not particularly diseases. Okay, we 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 use it too narrowly, uh, too narrowly already. Okay, it is not just particularly talking about diseases. Now, how do we find the curses part? Go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. I read for you from my Bible. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole or hung on the tree, okay? He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit, okay? This is Galatians 3, 13, 14. So you see the word blessing, you see the word cursing, curses. What does it remind you? Covenant. So who took the, the consequences of it? On the cross, Christ. Okay? So because of that, that's the reason why. That's the reason why. It is called by his stripes, we are healed. The curses doesn't come to us anymore. We are healed. Okay? So it's not that kind of healing per se, but this healing per se. And so, if God has come to that place, now think with me for a while. Do not believe in him or rejecting him ultimately will be punished by what kind of means? Ultimately, it will be punished through the forever eternal banishment from the presence of God. The eternal exile from the presence of God. Okay? Because God has already sent his ultimate. And he has already accomplished the work of bearing sins and curses of humanity on himself. Okay? So that is why. All right, guys. Any more questions? I don't see. Okay, Karina. I met someone recently who asked why there were so many forms of Christianity as well as the similarity of Islam and Christianity. And after the explanation on idolatry and man's replication of the worship of God, the two cows that help open up my understanding of why in reference to the person's question. We can come so close to God yet miss Him entirely. You are right. And that coming so close and miss Him entirely, right? As you can see from today's lesson, right? It is not because that they don't believe in God. It is not because that they don't believe. They believed. But they cannot just have Him only. That's the problem. They feel he is not enough. 
I see that's the problem. You see, so you see, man is capable of adding it, adding to it, and when he adds to it, he can convince himself that this is actually what God wants of me. Are, are you with me? So exactly that is the situation that Jesus came. The Pharisees doesn't want. So. You now understand, Pharisees is not just a group of people. Pharisees can be in anybody's heart. We add to it. We subtract from it. We water down this part. We thicken up the other part. Right? So that's why you have all these kind of things. Huh? Okay? Because, and then that drills down to just now my, my point. Because they have their personal agenda in mind. They want God to be like what? So that what that you want ultimately becomes you, not God anymore. All right? So that's the problem. Now, Serene said, instead of following what we think it was right, we should follow what is right in God's eye. Yes. And I ask myself a lot for today is that, am I prioritizing too much on other stuff instead of God? Yes, 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 yes. So true, so true, so true. So many times we prioritize many other things. And we think that that is what God wants me to do. Sometimes we can convince ourselves on that actually God wants me to do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. No, but actually, did God ask him to do that? And what is the most important that what God wants us to do? You know? And, and it's to know him. It's to know him. It's to know Jesus. Do we spend time knowing him? If he has given us revelation through scripture, right, that talks about Christ, and now we, we already read this biblical theology, we already know the history of redemption, right? Has a point with Christ to Christ, right? When we read the scripture, what are we reading from it? Are we reading what we actually want to read sometimes, right? Or we actually ask God, God, teach me. You know, if this is what you're talking about, you say the Old Testament is talking about you. I want to read the Old Testament and see you. Right? So, it helps when you have biblical theology in mind, you don't just simply take one story. Ah, yeah, this is another story. Ah, yeah, this Daniel, I also don't know what you're talking about. Ah, yeah, this, ah, that, ah, that. Oh, yeah, these, these kings, ah, I also don't know what these kings all about. Read all these kings for what? So boring, I also don't know them. They, know, they might know me, lah, but I also don't know them. Read them for what? You see? You, you miss the whole point. You so come so close. You come to the scripture already. And God is trying to tell you. But then you miss it. Because why? In our hearts, we have something on. I've got no time for this. When, when you compare, hey, actually, read other things, uh, i got time. I show a lot of interest. I'll follow the rabbit hole to wherever it comes from. See? So that also reflects to us. But, you know, don't give up. You know, don't feel too bad that, you know, it's like uh, you forever cannot reach there. No. No. It, that's why it is. By our own strength, yes. No, anyone can pick up the Bible and read. Anyone. Pagans also can read. You know, unbelievers also, they can read. But only with, only the believers, with the help of the Holy Spirit, are able to read the Bible and come to faith in Christ and come to believe in Christ and come to trust in God. Only the Christians who has the Holy Spirit living in them can their mind be illuminated? If not, uh, anybody read the Bible uh, already become Christian you know, a long time ago. But no, that's the reason why we don't give up, but we work with the Holy Spirit. We yield ourselves to the Spirit of God. Because He's the one, He's the Spirit of Revelation, He's the one, that, you know, through the inspiration of the Spirit, the Spirit, God breathed, right? He's inspired into men. So, the Scripture comes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as well, all right? So I hope this will help all of you here. If you have any other question, you can PM me. If not, I think tonight we are good to go here. Any more question? Okay, I'll just wait for last 10 seconds. If you have question, you can type or you can ask me. Good, huh, guys. Good reflection, guys. I'm really, really proud of you. I'm really proud of what I'm seeing and reading here. I think you guys are making a lot, a lot of progress. Very well done. Okay. So, uh, good. Okay. I think if you have no questions, then um, uh, we shall 
call it a night, but let us pray first, okay? Um, when we close this time, okay? All right, Father, we give thanks to you tonight for helping us, O oh God, and showing to us, your children, God, all these precious thoughts and promises and so important things that you want us to recapture or to come to understand. We thank you for your word, O oh God, that's able to shine your light on us. And thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit that when we read through scriptures, O oh God, Lord, that you bring out principles so close and so clear to us, O oh God, that has to do with our life, our everyday life, every moment, in fact, every single moment, O oh God. Lord, we acknowledge our weaknesses. We acknowledge that without you, O oh God, we can do nothing and we can bear no fruit, O oh God. We need you. We need you. We need your word, O oh God. We need your spirit, O oh God to remind us. We need the word of Christ, O oh God, to remind us, O oh God. And we ask, O oh God, Lord, that you may continue, Lord, to bring us, attract us closer and closer to you so that our repentance toward you, O oh God, will be deeper and deeper every single day. We want and we long to be transformed more and more into the image of your Son, into the image of Christ, our Lord and Savior. So, Lord, we pray, O oh God, that you may help us. Lord, that you may hear our cry, O oh God. Hear our prayer. Help us. Speak to us your word and guide us, O oh God. Lord, by your word, O oh God, and by the leading of the Holy Spirit that you have placed in us as a seal, as a guarantee, O oh God, of our salvation in you. God, we give thanks to you and we ask, O oh God, that you may help us expose the idols that is in our hearts, that is in our mind, whatever, O oh God, that is taking priority over you, O oh God. Lord, help us. Because when we do that, O oh God, that pleases your heart to know that your children seek after you and you alone, O oh God. We do not want to make any other gods. We do not want to have any other gods besides you, O oh God. Help us, O oh Father. Teach us, O oh God, and guide us through your gentle spirit. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Everyone says, Amen. Okay, guys, thank you so much for staying on tonight and uh, have a good rest, okay? I'll see you guys next week for another exciting episode. Okay, bye-bye. Good night. <laughs>